Evolutionary.org presents Evolutionary Hardcore Podcast with your co-hosts, Steve from the American Underground and Mobster from the UK Iron Den. Get ready for the most hardcore and underground info in the industry. And here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Morning, everyone. Hey, what's up, buddy? Uh, Bob Paris podcast coming your way this is the hardcore evolutionary episode this is number 125 bob paris guys very very interesting character steve smee here in the mobster what's up buddy i'll do it yeah two wet i need wading boots and, and maybe a small model of the ark if the raining wells carries on but everything else is golden let's hit it yes sir yes sir so bob paris who is bob paris guys you guys may not have heard of him um, this guy is one of those guys uh, very similar to some of these other bodybuilders that we've talked about in that he does a lot of different things. He's, he's, a, he's a poet, he's a screenwriter, he's a novelist, he's, um, he's done public speaking, he's a social activist, a retired professional athlete. He did bodybuilding. He was known, especially during the 80s, a little bit early 90s. He was in the top 10, Mr. Olympia. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But most um, interestingly, and the reason that we're even talking about him, perhaps, is he was the first openly homosexual professional athlete. So in this podcast, guys, we're going to go over his life. um, And we're going to talk about, I think the theme of this uh, podcast is going to be to be yourself. And a lot of times it's going to be hard to be yourself, but it's you know, it's one of those things, if you're not yourself, you're actually hurting yourself. So in the end, it's always better just Mm. to be yourself. Life is too short. So I think that's going to be the theme of this podcast. We're going to go over his life. So let's start out with, you know, his stats. Um, You know, during his peak, five foot 10, 220 pounds lean. Um, His physique, the old classic, old school physique for sure. And it's a physique that we all strive for. Every spring going into the summer, you know, we're planning our beach vacation. We want to look like him. We want to have that look. Not a monster by any means, but he is ripped um, to the core. Eight pack, you know, the beach body look. And during his peak, he looked like a beast for his time. So in his um, Mr. Olympia mm-hmm. placings confirmed that. So let's kind of get into his history a little bit. I'm going to bring in Mobster shortly. He was born in 1951 in the Midwest, Indiana. When he was growing up, he did a lot of outdoor activities. He liked to kayak, hike, cycling. Um, he was in the rural, from the rural Midwest. He took advantage of the, the wilderness of the, of the Midwest, the untouched wilderness. Um, he was also a gifted writer an artist. He was a painter. He loved art and he got into the performing arts and he played in many plays as a teenager. He was in, he was in theater and uh, which is interesting because I was in theater as well. I don't know, mobster, did you do any theater and and growing up? One of my subjects for the last few years at school and and, uh, O-level CSE as we would use back in the day, yeah, I did a bit of drama. So that would be what you would call fierce. Well, you're, you like to talk. That's why we do this kind of podcast. Yeah, Yeah. it helps you on this podcast. podcast. I think it's helped both of us. (laughs) So, so Bob, he he also played football. He was a high school football player. He was into golf. Interestingly enough, golf, that's a, that's interesting. Mix, oh, football and golf. Um, not and many. Yeah. So what's, what's interesting. Um, and he talks about this on his website is that there's a cool story where the, uh, his high school teacher sent him yeah. to the basketball gym to grab something for him. Right. So when he goes there in the bas- back of the basketball gym, he finds an old dusty weight machine and he starts playing around with it and that's how he discovers weight training and right off the bat his genetics were excellent he built a lot of size a lot of strength and he started losing interest in team sports and he started transitioning to weight training which is kind of what i did too because when i was in high school i did team sports early on 
Then as it went on, I kind of went to weight. Yeah. The thing I liked Very about cool. weight training mm. was that it was just you doing it. It's not, you're not at the mercy of other people. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I kind of liked that. I was, I was in control. I'm a control freak, type A personality. So for yeah. me, weight training was like the best thing ever for me. So thank goodness for weight training um, because I didn't like, sports where i had to depend on the person next to me to do their job so this worked out good for him um and after high school he was in a boot camp a usmc boot camp in south carolina then he went to uh wow indiana, indiana state university in the university he served in the marines while he was also in university so Eventually, he set out to California to pursue his dream of becoming an elite bodybuilder and working actor. So in, yeah. the, in that time, guys, if you wanted to be become a bodybuilder, be, this is before social media, before all this stuff, yeah. you had to go to South California. That was where you had to go if you wanted to get into acting or if you wanted to get into bodybuilding. That's the hub of bodybuilding and acting. So things have changed today. You know, you have other parts. You can be anywhere in the world now and do it. So I'm going to bring in Mobster. So tell us a little bit of, uh, tell us your opinions on this stuff. Yeah. I was going to say, first off, I, I, I didn't know that he was in the Marines. So that's that's fantastic. I know that the uh, military in America uh, around that time started to introduce this idea that you could do a college and university support. So that's amazing too, and help him. I was just thinking when you mentioned about the California thing, he started right at the bottom here, people. He was literally one of those guys that slept in his car in order to achieve the dream. So this is one of those kind of feel good stories, as we said earlier on about being yourself. And in fact, it, one of the things that I occasionally talk to people about in terms of becoming a better athlete is that you need to understand what motivates you, what drives you. When we addressed this in the podcast, here's a guy that learned how to understand himself and then obviously he went on to help other people which we'll get into but yeah sleeping in his car Steve that that's you know the whole actor in Hollywood and the whole bodybuilder in South California Venice Beach when when you're you're doing the thing where you are sleeping in the car you are driving the car up into the hills parking up in the hills so you don't get arrested by the police and then coming back down and then doing your grind in the gym that's just that's the very very bottom that you're starting from and he he rose quite high not just in terms of his physique, but as a person, from 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 the very bottom, really, as a bodybuilder, that's just about as basic as it gets. Steve, you know, living out of the, living out of the car, eating, trying to get the money together for protein, and and hopefully training in gyms like Gold's Gym and Welch Gym in order to make it. In fact, I know it was Welch Gym because there's a great video of him teasing a Joe Gold through a uh, workout, a leg workout, I believe. And so, yeah. That that he'd made he had, at that point he'd made it and he was becoming a, a big name bodybuilder. Well, we'll get into other stuff that came off of that later on, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. So after all that, you know, he had to like Mobster said he he had to do it. I mean, back then guys guys had no problem doing it. They had no problem picking their stuff up, heading out to California with no money, sleeping out of their car to pursue their dreams. You could do that back then. You yeah, could do yeah, that yeah. Uh, today. That's much harder to do. I think. Um, I think today, if you're a bodybuilder and you want to get into bodybuilding, you would approach it differently. I think today, Mobster, you would you would go on social media. You would do in his situation. I think they would do webcam work to make money off of that. Yeah. They would there's thing websites like OnlyFans where you can go. Um, there's yeah. Um, Patreon. You can set up a Patreon and put videos of yourself and have people pay you. Um, there's all kinds of stuff now, options. Um, so things have changed a lot with the internet. This is what I was thinking. I said, Bob's physique, which as you just said earlier on, is really a physique that 90% of our listeners would, would aspire to. And with his looks and his ability and the, the dramatic background, and because he even did acting later on as, after he retired as a bodybuilder, can you imagine how popular he would be at his peak on any of those sites that you just mentioned, he'd be a, he'd smash it. So he, he's right up there with any of the fitness figure guys that you can think of in terms of his looks and his aesthetic and whatever else. He, he would absolutely kill, he would have made millions, man. He'd have, he would have smashed that out of the park. And, and, and his ability to talk, his ability to be direct, his ability to communicate and connect with the audience. And he's, he's, he's a very good looking fella. Uh, and, and and he has that physique that 90 percent 90 never mind 90 percent of our listeners 90 percent of most people would aspire to he was uh 
If he'd have been born in the 18th and 19th century, he would have been modeling for statues. That's how good his physique was. As you say, not a freak by any stretch of the imagination. And a very good poser. What physique he did have, he was able to display very, very well. I mean, I literally looked at one video, but I know by reputation he was a great poser and put that across. That on Instagram, that on YouTube, that on any of the, the fan type sites, et cetera, et cetera. He, he would have killed it, Steve. Absolutely. Hold the money up and be tripping over the dollars all day long. So for sure. And I said, well, we'll get into the only problem that he had, but we'll get into that in a minute in terms of the issues that he would have had, as he did have at the time back in the 90s versus now when, when society's changed. Yeah, and then now if you search for him on Instagram or social media, you'll see fan pages of him with pictures, posing, and stuff like that. So that's kind of interesting that there's people out there who are fans of him, even to this day, who post up different yeah. social media pictures of him. So if he had access to this stuff, back then you know it would have been a different story he wouldn't have to be uh sleeping out of his car so things have have changed for sure that's the approach those of you who are aspiring in the bodybuilding that that would be an option for you to aspire from but let's kind of get into now his um you know some of his accomplishments um so basically he would place in the top 10 mr olympia three times during the 80s um, he would routinely, routinely compete at the Grand Prix worldwide. That was his favorite, the Arnold Classic, Nine of Champions, placing in the top 10 over and over. Um, he only won a few contests outright, which, you know, in those days was hard to do. Now there's so many yes. um, ways you can win, so many classes. You know, you, got, you get first place in, in this class. You can compete in five different classes. Um, so he was far from the biggest bodybuilder. But he arguably had one of the most perfect bodies during the era. And he was yeah. actually named most athletic athlete in history of bodybuilding by Flex Magazine. So very, very interesting stuff on him. And I can kind of look at um, some of his placings. We can go kind of go through his, um, his placings. I was a professional. He was seventh in, in, in uh, Mr. Olympia in 1984. In, yeah. in the next year, he was ninth. In 88, he was 10th. In 89, he was 14th. And then in 91, he was 12th. So that's very, very impressive. Very, very uh, consistent top, top 10, top 12 placings. And then the uh, Grand Prix in 1988, he got third. And uh, Night of Champions the same year, he got third. So 1988 is when he peaked. And he also, the Italian Grand Prix, he was also third. So he seemed to peak in the, in the very late 80s and then uh, through 91. So you know, we can kind of get into now his, um, you know, his homosexuality. Um, basically, yeah. in 1989 is when he came out. And he came yeah. out as being gay in Iron Man magazine. So a lot of you guys, young guys might not understand this, but in the 80s, um, you know, coming out gay, uh, most of the country back then did not support, you know, gay support. You know, get, you know, being gay and all this stuff. So to come out was very, very brave at that time. And I'll, I'll bring. You got to remember, sir. Steve. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But one of the issues at the time, which was nothing to do with Bob, of course, was we had the AIDS epidemic in the early eighties, and people were scared. Now, without getting into the religious or the political or the social aspects, that was just like that particular thing, and you coming out as a gay, instant connection. And of course, it's nothing to do with Bob. It's not Bob's fault, but. There's that issue. In fact, you mentioned this is coming out uh, in, in uh, Iron Man magazine. He's done an, an interview, which part of the research for the show. He talks about how he'd actually mentioned it in several interviews, but it it, it, it out. It, it's only when he sat down with Lonely Teeper for Iron Man that it was kept in. And of course, as Steve and I have addressed this in the pre-show, the impact that it had on his career in terms of sponsorship and appearances. He, he says in, in the interview, he went from, from, let's say, 10 appearances to one appearance. He lost literally 90% of the business that enabled him to support himself as a professional bodybuilder. And I'm gonna assume, Steve, that put the, 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 the effect on his show places. Now this isn't necessarily from the people's uh, dislike of homosexuality, so much as quite simply the bottom line, the dollar. and you know, is can can we be seen to support? And it, it's a different time. How we've changed in the last 30 to 40 years and our thought processes and, and our acceptance, and that's from a purely business point of view, never mind sociological society, it, it's, it's completely different, completely different. I mean, just 20 years ago, uh, my own personal experience, the pink pound 
the, the, the money that homosexuals could bring to any business became a big, big thing. So commercially, uh, sponsors stopped sponsoring him and people stopped asking him to do, you know, uh, posing and exhibitions and gym seminars and stuff like that. And that was part of that time. And as Steve said, what, how we are now, how we think now, our acceptance, you know, everybody's going to have an opinion. You can you can think whatever you like, guys. We're not here to say one way or the other, but it is different, and that's just stating the fact. That's just, you can't argue that at all. So yes, yeah, Steve. Yeah, and you know he got death threats for this. Um, yeah. It's it's really um, it's really crazy. Um, but he he had, he was very courageous, and um, so. In the end, British Columbia and Canada legalized gay marriage. So he was able to marry his partner, Brian, in Canada, where they live. And Bob did not give up. He tried to get gay marriage uh, legalized, legalized in the United yeah. States because yeah. only in the United States, uh, certain states had civil unions and certain states had legalized gay marriage. But all 50 states, most of the states did not. So he wanted to get it legalized in the United States. So he pushed to get it. And then in 2015, the United States legalized gay marriage in all 50 states. And at the time when it happened, oddly enough, most people were fine with it, you know? Um, and then now, literally six years later, we're doing this podcast. Now, no one cares, you know? No one cares if a gay person wants to get married. I'm not married. Mobster isn't married. No, I mean, no, no. we're straight. Never be married. No. Yeah, I mean... In my, if I want to go get married tomorrow, I might meet some girl. I want to fly her to Vegas and get married. That's my business. And it people, it, people yeah. have realized that. So it's like nobody cares anymore. If you're gay, straight, bi, whatever, <laughs> you want to get married, go get married. You, no, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So I joke around a lot, like, you know, uh, uh, yeah. with my married friends. But I mean, hey, if you want to go ruin your life and get married, go, go get married. That's, that's why I, <laughs> yeah. I, I joke around with them. Yeah. So I'll let mom. I, I was going to say, you said uh, one of the things that was between the 1980s and, and 2015, Bob was uh, quite a, a, a supporter of civil rights. In fact, there's a bunch of, interview, of interviews, quite a few actually. I didn't even watch the, um, the big one, but he did a bunch of uh, track show interviews at, at the time. And here's the thing we're going back to that dramatic thing that we mentioned at the beginning. He's a good looking fella. He's got muscles and he speaks very well. He's not flustered. The audience quite often, especially on a chat show, you can know how this is done with this kind of stuff. They've got people that are for and against. They've got people that are agitators, whatever else, and never got flustered. Spoke very well. Talked about, obviously, you know, if you love someone, you should be allowed to love them. If you want to, to, to quantify that love as getting married and all that kind of stuff and how in fact, one of the things I discussed in the pre-show with Steve, it wasn't as such as, 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 as homosexual uh, marriages, uh, same-sex marriages were illegal, as in you couldn't, you'd go, you'd register, you'd fill out the documentation and it would be sent back to you. It would get so far and then that was it. It's only, it had to be approved, if you, if you like, and recognised in order for the legalisation process to go further ahead. And, and Bob was a big part of that. I mean, it wasn't the only, there were many, many speakers uh, from from all different kinds of society, and and from political, uh, from from the movies, from show business, etc., etc., etc. But Bob was that person that's coming from the bodybuilding community. That person that was able to put this stuff across. He's done a bunch of magazine interviews, and in fact, one of the things we was I said to Stephen in the pre-show, he's written seven books. I've got one of his books upstairs, Gorilla Suit, which addresses it in passing. The stuff that he's done on his blog is very supportive of other people that are struggling with their particular issues. When I say civil rights, I'm not specifically talking about homosexuality, but a bunch of things. You know, as, as Steve and I said, the important thing that we think you want to take away from the end of this podcast is being yourself, being who you are. Uh, some, you know, whether it's going to be a political opinion that people are going to differ over. I mean, the great thing is I, I doubt very much that Steve and I agree politically. In fact, we've never discussed it, but we can have that conversation without threatening each other we could do the same thing in, in regards of uh, any sexual ideas that we have and so on and so forth this is the stuff that we should be okay and should be all right about as steve said already when you get to me it's kind of and I'm, i try not to be insulting but it, how crazy is it when when you say oh because of i think a particular sexual way that someone threatens to kill you that's that's changed 
that's changed. I, I'm glad that that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and this is what this guy went through in order to become the person he is today. And in fact, I watched an interview from, I believe, 2015, uh, which I'm going to say was for a gay magazine. It was done as a, a video. Again, it's available on YouTube. Uh, and he talks about a, a great deal of stuff. And he's st still a good looking fella, still comes across incredibly well. Uh, and I think um, society was lucky to have him because of his ability to put himself across in a way that wasn't upsetting, that he, would, he, he didn't get a struggle with it. And he was able to be eloquent in telling his side of the story and, and putting his point across. It was very good for him in that particular way. And he's done a, he's done a great service to civil rights. It was just a bit of a struggle uh, when, when he came out, as you say, in Iron Man magazine, Steve. And obviously that affected him as a professional. So you think about it, it's gone from sleeping in a car to getting into the top 10 in Olympia. Uh, incredibly good looking, getting lots of photographic work, lots of modeling work, lots of support through the bodybuilding and then also have that knock back and then kind of build yourself back up again as a civil rights a supporter and speaker in, a, in another way kind of a different kind of career to the top again to the point where you're being asked onto Oprah and a bunch of other shows and being interviewed for magazines and, and I don't doubt at all probably meeting politicians and having that kind of influence so yeah, it's getting knocked back down again and building back up again so for that we should admire. So we're going to kind of get into his, his diet his training, Mobster is going to talk about his training, and then we're going to get into the steroid talk because you guys all love to hear the steroid talk. So we're going to hit the steroid talk for a solid twenty minutes to, to finish the podcast. But first, let's kind of get into his diet a little bit, and we we talk about this for a couple minutes. So he talks about in, in his blog <clears throat> that he grew up, you know, rural Midwest, the North and South blended together, culture and cuisine. So. Mm -hmm. He grew up eating a diet of deep fried everything, they, deep fried chicken, deep fried catfish, deep fried pork, um, huge portions, and you have to finish your portions growing up. Deep fried everything, uh, meat-centric meals, uh, heavily buttered vegetables, potatoes, so forth. So, you know, that's, that's the way he grew up eating. Um, then his parents got divorced when he was 15. He went to live with his dad. And he started eating, you know, random things with his dad. His dad wasn't a great cook. Um, basically, his dad just fed him fast food, whatever was around. So he did that for a year, just completely eating crap. And then a year later, that's when he found weight training. And he realized when he was weight training, wow, I actually was able to get leaner see my abs by actually not eating this crap yeah. i've been eating my whole life so that's when he discovered <laughs> nutrition and and he realized he that and he's like man if i want to see my abs i gotta eat better so what's interesting with him is he got into cooking and his partner and his uh husband also was into cooking so they started to you know cook together and stuff and that's how he kind of, you know, uh, got into nutrition. He kind of learned from that. So he talks about nutrition a little bit. He's very, very obsessed with vegetables, uh, fibrous vegetables. He says that it's the mortar that holds the bricks of your nutrition together. He's like, they're the stabilizers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason for that is he, it's, they stabilize insulin release. So if you can get that insulin level stabilized after meals, you will get less fat from your food. So you can eat more protein without storing as much fat. So he, this is one of the things that he pushes um, that you have to do that for both detoxing and also to stabilize your blood sugar. So, and he's very specific about eating a healthy diet. Very, very important, home cooked meals. He talks about avoiding restaurant food, avoiding fast food, because those foods have the refined oils, the salts, the sugars, all that stuff that they add to it, the preservatives to make it last, but also to make it say, you know, satiating and taste good so that you can leave the restaurant saying, Hey, you know, all this stuff was yes. good. I'm full. Yeah. And that's not the correct way to eat. So he talks about that guys really, really simple. So mobster, tell us a little bit about his training and, and your other thoughts. I was just going to touch on nutrition just for a second there, Steve. Both you and I have addressed via the forums, and the guys, our listeners are welcome to check this out. We talk about learning to cook for yourself. 
what we was, what was described as from scratch, literally peeling the vegetables, getting the stuff ready, getting all the nutrition. Um, there's a generation in the States and a generation following them in, in the UK that can't cook. And they're, they're 25 years of age. They've left home and they don't know how to prepare a meal. You, you can learn that. And like, like Bob, learn how to control your nutrition and see the effect that it has on your body, you'll do well. And of course, it means you're grown up and self-sufficient. So when the fast food's not there, guys, you can still make something to eat as opposed to going with air. Just fatherly advice from Uncle Mobster. Right, training. This is, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna run for this point by point, Steve. So he talks about rest being as important as the training. And this is something sometimes, especially with the younger guys, they forget and they're so keen and they like training so much that they start hitting the gym two, sometimes three times a day. And, and it takes them over training. In fact, you just addressed this on a recent podcast and I said, yeah, of course, you can still overtrain on PEDS. You can still overtrain on steroids, guys. So here's him, who's a professional bodybuilder, when he's giving this information out, telling you, train by all means, but make sure that your rest is balanced in there. Now, something I've been doing for a long time, and in fact, I probably need to start doing this again uh, more. I, I, I've kept a training diary probably since the age of 18. And when I'm training for competitions, I will specifically write down the workout that I need to do and try to make sure that I hit that in the gym versus the workout that I've done. So a, a record of what was hap happened. Now, this is a target. And he talks about writing that, write down your goals before each training session, read them to yourself. And in fact, this is kind of self-visualization, which he also talks about in terms of, you, 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 you know, whether you're sitting in the toilet, whether you're driving in, in the car to the gym and you're thinking about the workout that's going to happen. And sometimes there's a sort of positive affirmation insofar as that what you thought about what you were thinking about what you mentally rehearsed then happens because it's kind of already happened in your mind it's also not big things and and this is something we'll discuss with some of the guys when they're training here with me just adding more weight to the bar isn't the only way that you're going to grow in a gym you can you can do more sets you can do more volume you can uh, manipulate the, the variables in terms of training form you can change exercises around I wouldn't even use the word stronger, Steve. I would say progression because he didn't need to be the biggest, strongest guy. He needed to progress. He needed to add muscle and he needed to look good. It says uh, something else. One of the guys yesterday was training here and he says, I'm having, I'm having a bad day. I says, mate, we all have bad days. And Bob says, don't beat yourself up if you get off track with your training. It's not a linear process. Day one, I'm this size. Day 100, I'm this much bigger. Sometimes there's going to be a bad night's sleep. Sometimes you're not going to get the rest. Sometimes your food's going to be off. Sometimes the, your girlfriend's kicking your ass, whatever. And these will affect your training. So long as your progression over time is there, that's where, where, where success will come. And that's he, he addresses that. It, something else as well, and I mentioned it just now, he was never, ever the strongest guy in the gym. Not even We're not talking about a 500 bench or a 700 pound squat area. But what we're saying is guy, whose form and on the few videos i've seen his form was spot on he was one of those guys that's going to get a great workout with light to medium weights because his form is immaculate his tempo is perfect if he if he needed to change position of his feet would do that if he needed to change the space of his hands would do that and it's almost and I've, I've used this phraseology before it's like he's showing you how an exercise is supposed to be done as long as he's teaching you the perfect form for the bench, the perfect form for the press, the perfect form for the squat. And another thing, and of course, I'm very guilty of this. He says, when you do a set, feel the muscles being worked. Don't just swing the muscles, the, the, the weights around. Now, me, I'm more of a strength athlete. It's weight from A to B. On the occasions when I train for muscle, when I when I want, and I would teach the guys this, we would slow things down. We would, I would put my fingers onto their chest or say, well, I want you to push your chest against my fingers when, when you're doing flyers, when you're doing dumbbell bench or whatever else. And this is what he's saying. Feel the muscle that's being targeted. If it's bicep, if you're doing a curl, you're supposed to be working biceps. You're not working your ego. You're not working your front delt. You're working biceps. So feel that. And in fact, I mentioned this in the pre earlier on, was there the video clip of him training with uh, Joe Gold in Welch Gym, like they were buddies. <laughs> he's ragging on Joe's ass uh, to do uh, leg extensions and he's saying he won't walk for three days after this. He's making Joe Gold, owner of Gold's Gym uh, and uh, for, uh, founder of Gold's Gym and owner of Welch Gym at the time, work properly in the gym. 
and it's done as a bit of fun and as a bit of season for the video, but that's actually how things are supposed to be done. You should, you should when you're, if you train with buddies, if you have a, a training partner, or even if you're in the gym, it serves you well to show other people how to train properly. And of course, at the same time, do it yourself. And I quite often say to the younger guys, imagine there's a group of people watching you and you are teaching them how to do the exercise. And that's, that's all these are pieces of advice that Bob gave out as far as training. And I'm going to say, Steve, I think he applied himself to him for pretty well from what we've seen. And of course, from the, the body that he was able to produce. So, so shall we get into the steroids? Yes, sir. Yeah. And he, he had definitely fantastic genetics. It, it, you know, there's no telling if he had been eating good as a child. I, I have, I have friends. Oh, yeah. I have friends that, you know, I used to train with uh, doing Ironman and stuff. And I swear some of them are so good at it because they grew up eating fresh fruits and vegetables from their mm. farm growing up. Mm. And they, they have it it makes a difference as an adult so if he had the grown up eating not eating this crap that he was eating there's no telling what what he would have done i i think he would have definitely gotten top three mr olympia for sure i think so too With his so, so just to interrupt steve i've actually just i've just been reading a, 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 a biography written by a fellow a friend of mine who's just recently passed away on on john grimek and john grimek was so poor as a young man as a child and, and as a teenager, that they, they, it was during the depression the, the, back in the 1930s, and the diet consisted of at times you're going to love this, Steve, bread and coffee. For some particular reason, those two things were still cheap when everything else was expensive. And he talks about training and actually adding a couple of inches to his height, but he only ended up around five foot nine. And one could argue, as you just said, one can only imagine if as great a bodybuilder as John Grimet became how could he have been if he'd actually been able to eat well during the depression so yeah there's there's, there's a possibility that those are the formative years those are when you're gonna gonna reach a maximum height maximum bone structure and so on so yes they, yeah and then you know we we can apply that to training to, to nutrition and of course yeah. steroids um you know we know so much more than the guys knew back then so you know we can kind of go over and talk about what he ran during the uh, mm -hmm. mid mid to late 80s when he was peaking so you know what, that was a transitioning period between the golden age and the monsters that we started seeing in the 90s. So, you know, definitely Prima Bowen was the big one. Prima Bowen was the most popular steroid for guys who are into the aesthetic physiques of the 70s and 80s. That was Arnold's favorite steroid. The nice thing about Prima Bowen, guys, it's a DHT derivative, but it also doesn't come with really bad side effects number one number two mm. since it's a dhc derivative it does not aromatize into estrogen does not bind to estrogen receptors you know you can run a lot of it and get and not have any side effects not lose your hair even though it's a dhc derivative it doesn't give you these dhc sides so guys could run it especially these models they could run it at high dosages and they're okay so what he would, what he, these guys would do, they would run over 500 milligrams a week of Primo Bolin. And at that time, you could get legal pharmacy grade Primo Bolin. You could yeah. get that. It was still being sold. And even when steroids, you know, were clamped down in the United States, they could still have it imported from, if you knew, you know, someone, and there was always the, the, the guy in the gym who had the connection, you could go to him, you can have it imported from overseas legitimate bear primo and these that's what these guys were were using so for that reason and you could run it for a longer period of time at a high dosage and it would give you that nice physique look it would lean you lean you out give you those cuts make you harder make you more vascular and give you that anabolic energetic benefits to help you boost protein synthesis in your body and help you build more muscle. So that's why these guys loved it. Now, since Prima Bowen doesn't have those androgenic, the androgenic effect, we could speculate he would throw in some D-Bowl here and there, maybe one or two caps of D-Bowl, tabs of D-Bowl, 10 or 12, 20 milligrams, just to throw it in there. And it's a low enough dose that it's not gonna give him the water retention. It's not gonna give him that water retention. Now, the third steroid that the guys love to use was Decadurobolin. 
and they would they would jack the decadero bowling up as well. And the reason that they would love decadero bowling is decadero bowling aromatizes at a at a fourth or fifth the amount of testosterone. So guys in that time they didn't have access to aromatized inhibitors. They didn't have access to anti-estrogens. This was before those came along. And really, um, aromatized inhibitors didn't even they didn't even really come along in bodybuilding to the mid to late nineties even, because in the yeah. late eighties, early nineties, they were using the Novadex, which is a selective estrogen receptor monitor, a CIRM. It is not an aromatized inhibitor. So, but that's besides the point. But the guys at that time they used Deca instead of testosterone because Deca is the same thing as testosterone, but it's missing that one atom, the nineteen nor. So mm. by taking that 19 ore, it makes the DECA less androgenic <clears throat> and way less of a aromatizing compound. So that's why they would use that stack, the Primo, Debo, DECA stack, instead of Primo, Debo, testosterone. So that's why they would do that back then. And the reason it worked good for them is because they knew to use Proviron. Because you're going to say, oh, my God, you know, if you don't use testosterone with DECA, you're going to get DECA dick. Well, that's not true as long as you use Proviron. And you can still get DECA dick using DECA with testosterone. We see it all the time on, you know, people always post that. Uh, we get at least once a week, we get someone posting that. So <laughs> but the Proviron being a DHT derivative, a straight DHT derivative, along with the Primobolin being a DHT derivative, those work together to offset that rise from the DECA metabolizing in the body as dihydronandrolone, mm -hmm. that DHN. So you got that DHT offsetting the DHN. So you don't get that DECA dick issue. You don't get the erectile issues with, with uh, your penile strength. So that was very, very important. So that's what we think he used, the Primo, the D-Bowl, the DECA, the Proviron. And that stack, you guys can use that stack today. And if you want that type of physique, you can use those yeah. four together yeah, and yeah. it won't be a bad stack when it comes to side effects and it won't destroy Nothing. your heart health. Like some other stacks that I see out there, it won't give you the energetic side effects. It won't destroy your hair. That is really, really good with hair. Um, and it won't mess up your prostate like some of these other stacks. So you can apply that stack today. If you want that look, if you want that look. You also have to keep in mind he's got the amazing genetics to make this That's right. back so, yes. really work. Yes, yes, because yes. not all of you out there are just going to be able to use this stack and look like him. He had the tremendous genetics and he had been training for many, many years uh, since he was 15. So, you know, that's that's the that's the stack we think he used. Uh, so, Monster, I'm going to bring you in here. What do you think about this stack? And what would I'm going to I'm going to agree with you, Steve. I think we've talked about in previous podcasts that I seem to recall uh, the, the stories of the pharmacy or the doctor that was uh, available around that time to give you a script and enabled you, as you say, to get legitimate over-the-counter prescription drugs, uh, specifically steroids, as we're talking about here. It's also well worth mentioning, of course, that he was not a big fan and, in fact, has been quite vocal of this, even, even up to recent years. But specifically, I'm talking about Battle for the Olympia-type videos back in the day, 80s and 90s, when he on camera is saying that he was not a fan of the crazy amount of drugs. And that was then, never mind the death cycles and stuff that we talked about in the last few years. We're talking about the, the mid to late 80s. And he was talking about high level cycles then, which would probably be three or four grams a week, Steve. And he was not a fan of taking loads and loads of steroids. And I think something that Steve touched on a little bit as well is quite simply, here's a guy that I don't recall having seen a photograph of him looking out of shape what we would call off season. I think he maintained a certain level of body fat that was moderate to low all year round, never really got out of shape. He's still got that athletic background and as he said, quite probably the genetics, but he, did, he, he wasn't a guy that was going to bulk up in the off season. He wasn't going to guy that's going to walk around 20% body fat for, for six months of the year and then get down to, into the low, uh, the low single digits or competition. In fact, a, 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 one would actually argue that I don't think he ever got down to two or three percent on stage, but it was probably around five or six percent, but just just based on his physique and how he looked. But again, we we're talking about genetics here, and specifically not getting out of shape, not needing to blow up, not needing to pile on water, not having life a whole levels of body fat. And in fact, 
in terms of his genetics, in one of the more recent, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll use the 2015 interview, which I watched yesterday, his calves still look athletic. He still looks in good shape. He's in shape for a guy that was 61 this year. And he's still got his own hair. So that Steve talks about the Decker. That hair that is on his head in the 2015 video, it's, it's not a piece, Steve. It's not plants. It's the same kind of hair that he had back in the 80s. In fact, if I was being slightly cheeky, I'd say it's the same hairstyle that he had back in the 80s. But that's the only knock on him. He looks good for 61. He looks in condition for 61. And that's part of that athletic background. That's part of the uh, uh, genetics. And that's, of course him deliberately having in his head this is how i want to look i want, want him to look like that all year round in fact think something you've addressed steve specifically for your own uh, personal aspirations in the sport about not getting too out of shape when you're not training for a competition and of course we know that these things are dose dependent we know that if, if, if you, you you if you're out of shape guys and uh, or even just as an example with, with the 400 milligrams of deca that's only a little bit more than i was using when, when I last did a, a, deca, a cycle that had Decker in it. And, you know, I'm a big fan of that stuff. I never had any issues. If you're out of shape or your dosages are high, you're going to have more problems. And, of course, what we also talk about on, online and discuss with the guys is as often as not, they're not telling us their blood pressure issues. They're not telling us if they've got pre, pre-existing medical issues. They're not telling us how out of shape they are. I'm taking this drug, Steve, and, and it's having its effects on me. Well, are you fat? Are you out of condition? Do you have blood pressure issues on your other meds? All of that, guys. And then, of course, sometimes, you know, Decker is a great curative when it really isn't for joint issues. And here's the thing again. I don't recall seeing anything with Bob talking about injuries, talking about joint problems, talking about not being able to train as an older gentleman. None of that. So he had half an eye, I think, in terms of both this cycle and his training not just on the physique that he had on stage, which was world-class, but on long-term health. And that's some drum that we beat regularly on this podcast when we say, yes, and no, we support your training. We understand your drive. We understand your aspirations, but you should have your mindset will change. Bob Harfink had that mindset right at the beginning, Steve. But from his use of the, this gear, he used the, the right amount to get exactly what he wanted. He didn't have to push in gram after gram. He didn't have to... It's, it's not, look, there's literally four drugs in this cycle, four. There are young guys out there that you and I right now that are doing six, and, and, and they're beginners. He's a prof- top 10 professional bodybuilder in the world, making the bucks, et cetera, et cetera, and he's only taking four really quite simple uh, steroids in a very easy cycle that, as you said, I think a bunch of guys, hell, I would do okay, you would do okay on this cycle. We would look pretty damn good. I think, and we would do very well on this. And in fact, it's it's still slightly more than the most I've ever taken, but compared to some of the cycles of the day, it it still works, guys. It's still still effective. If you've got everything else on point, you're you're going to come out of this looking good. If you've got his genetics, you're going to come out of this looking amazing. But the genetics is the role of the dice that we can't control. Everything else we can control. So here's the thing. You don't need, learn the lesson, guys. You don't need loads of drugs. This cycle will still work for you. His long-term health is, is great. His physique is still pretty good. He was world-class. His aesthetic, as Steve said, was outstanding. Probably the best in the world on stage at a time. I, I, I might, Steve, I don't know about you, I might be put Samir Banu up against him around that time in terms of the aesthetic physique. Mate, I can't think of anybody else or the two guys that stood on stage at that time. And we're not talking about a giant here. 5'9", and I, I've got I've got the statistics down for 225. So... By no means a big muscular physique, but people went crazy over how this guy looked, especially in modeling, especially before any potential issues came to the fore in terms of sponsorship and and, and everything else. And he, he was on a bunch of magazine covers just for how he looked. And so look at what he's got. If 90%, like I said, one of our listeners would love to look like Bob looks, would love to have that physique. The, the, the modeling agents would be falling over themselves. You'd be on the cover of Cosmo. This is the kind of look that they're looking for. This is the sort of stuff they're using in Perfume Boots now when they've got a, a, a supermodel on one side and they've got a muscular, aesthetic, Bob Paris look type model on the other arm. 
and, and that makes that's the kind of stuff there. So if, if he was around now as a bodybuilder, I think he'd be a multi-millionaire, Steve. I seriously do. And this is how he did it. That's not. I, I think without going on talking to the guy himself, this is almost certainly what he was doing at the time. Back to you. Yeah, and I think I think at the you know we can always go back. I think a lot of these guys throughout the '80s that we've done, you know, we can go back and say, "Wow, if only this, if only that." We go back mm. to Arnold in the '70s. What if he at the time had access to the weaponry they have today? It's, yes, it's, a, it's, a, yes. it's warfare today. It's chemical yeah. warfare. And um, thing, um, yeah, I, sorry, I was going to say I don't think Bob would, but then I I do agree that Arnold. Would 100%. I think Bob would not have gone down the chemical warfare road, but Arnold would. I think Arnold's drive and bodybuilders, even Lou and etc., that group to, to to desire and Arnold specifically to be the best in the world. I can see him taking full advantage of the other stuff that is available now. Whereas Bob, I'm not so sure about maybe Psalms, certainly GW and stuff like that. We've talked about before in terms of getting the shape. I can see him doing that. I can't see him as one of those going to go mega dose. I can't see him those going to be multiple peptides. Whereas Arnold, yeah, hundred percent, as you say, I think quite correctly that Arnold's drive to be the best and to want to kick ass and to dominate the platform in that particular way, uh, I think we could have seen him whether he likes to admit it now because, of course, he can look back and say otherwise. But I feel I believe he would have taken everything that was out there and available uh, within reason. Whereas Bob, I can't see that happening. I think Bob's uh, I, 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 image of himself knowledge of himself and his aesthetic means he wouldn't have gone crazy he wouldn't have taken loads of drugs and whatever so i could actually i think even with the changes i don't think it would have changed much about this cycle where certain other guys that we can name from that time would or franco i think might have done arnold for sure louis maybe and and, and i think of a few of the others by reputation in terms of mentality and i think of ken waller and and and, and a, is it steve michelak oh my god can you imagine the drugs that steve would have been on back in the day He'd be the Boston Lloyd of, of the 1980s for sure. He'd be taking everything that comes in a bottle and anything that doesn't come in a bottle. So, yeah, but Bob, no. Bob, I think, is aesthetic in his idea of himself. He'd have probably pretty much said, this worked. This got him into shape. This made him look the way that he looked. He probably didn't need to do anything else, and I can't say that he would have. But we do have these kind of conversations, and we, we have to wonder if the stuff's available, would they have taken it? Psalms, I can think he might have added something in there for sure. A little bit of growth hormone boosting and whatever else. Because he's outspoken specifically on the use of excessive amounts of drugs. So I can't see that that mentality would have changed. But for a certain other body, it was 100%. Yeah, Steve. I think, I think we've kind of gone full circle. I think we've uh, realized most people, you show, show someone a picture of Bob mm. Paris at his peak and then show someone yeah. a picture of, of Big Rammy today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At their peak. And they'll look at the picture and be like, is that real? The big Rammy one, they'll be like, is that yeah, real? Yeah. It doesn't yeah. seem realistic. And yeah. um, I think most women and, or men who are into, uh, into men who are homosexual will look at big Rammy's picture and be like, Ugh, that's disgusting. That's yeah, disgusting. That's like, so, but they'll look at Bob Paris's picture and be like, wow, gorgeous, gorgeous man. Um, perfect physique, beach body. And mm. uh, so I think we've gone full circle with it. You know, I think most people are more interested in achieving the Bob Paris physique than the big Rammy physique because they know the big Rammy physique is going to shorten your lifespan yeah. by 20, 30 years. It's the Bob unnatural. Paris physique is not. He's still going. No. He's still he's still no. going today. So he looks, he looks like a Tim Milo. He looks like someone that's been sculpted. Yep. He looks like someone to put him together as an artist. And as I said to you, I think if he'd have been born a couple of hundred years ago, there would have been artists sculpting at models out of marble based on his physique. He looks like a, a slightly heftier version of, of, of David, you know, the, the, the marble sculpture in Italy. He, he, he's got that kind of physique and that look to him. The only person I can think of with my knowledge of history is, is maybe Sandow. Sandow posing for certain uh, uh, sculptures back in the days. In fact, when he built his name up before he became a famous strongman, that's part of what he did. I can see Bob, Bob is right there or thereabouts. And I'll, I'll use the thing, I mentioned the perfume thing earlier on. I'll make this quite simple. So commercially, when you sell cars, it's always a sexy car on an open road, whereas in reality, it's going to be driven around the city by a mum. So that's that's how it works. With perfume adverts, they sell this idea of sex. So it's always a gorgeous, as I said earlier on, supermodel and a muscular, athletic-looking guy. Bob 
would sell that stuff till the cows come home. He has that look. So, and the perfume companies and, and the advertisers say, we know this is what everybody, if we could wave a magic wand and we didn't have to go to the gym and put the work in, this is how people would like to look. And Bob has that look. He, lo he looks like a guy that looks half for himself in terms of his face, his teeth and his hair. And he looks like a guy that's not trying to smash it in the gym. He's not trying to turn into a monster. He, look, he's the kind of guy, Steve said this, you're walking down the beach in a pair of beach shorts and the men and women are going, if only, <laughs> for different reasons, but if only. If he's got, if he's got his tan on, people will be coming up to him and saying, how do you work your abs? How do you do your legs? They do not, they're not going to ask Rami, you know, how do you do your biceps? Rami's going to be getting asked what drugs he's on. But regardless of what Rami does, they're going to be, that's the question they're going to be asking Rami. Whereas Bob, they're going to be saying, how do you do your cast? How do you work? Who does your hair? They're going to be asking that kind of stuff. And they're not going to be scared of him. They're not going to... It's, it's kind of, he has that sellability as, as, as a, from a commercial point of view and an approachability from an, an aesthetic and from a physique point of view that people would aspire to. It's every single survey they've probably done in the last 30 years, Steve, when they say, what, what is it that you want about your physique? Bob's got it. He, he, he had, he's got some of it now at 61. He had it then for sure back in 1980, 40 something years ago, 100%, 100%. So yeah, I mean, this is the thing, guys. Check him out. Go go on his go on his website. Check him out on YouTube. There's videos of him training and talking. There's certainly videos of him on on his game uh, uh, chat shows that I mentioned earlier. And go to Google Images and just put Bob Paris Bodybuilder Google Images. And in terms of the aesthetic, it's almost perfect for that kind of look, that kind of physique. I, I'm still a bit of a fan. It has to be said of the more muscular stuff, but that's probably for the freak value and the excitement and whatever. And you know, lifting crazy weights. But for ninety percent of our listeners, Bob would have been absolutely perfect. Steve, I, I agree hundred percent. Can't argue that one at all. All right, guys. So Bob Paris, definitely check him out for Steve Sme and the Mwapsta. This has been another hardcore episode. We'll talk to you guys next time. Have a good one. Shut up. <laughs>